Uh, it seems so. So hello to everybody. We are going to discuss now the new European regulation called the Foreign Services Regulation. Uh, as you know, uh, European companies have complained for decades that state aid was heavily regulated within Europe while uh, companies uh, in other countries could receive uh, help from uh, their states freely. Uh, and so uh, European businesses were uh, uh, wanting to, 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 have s to get something to get a level playing field. Now it's here. Uh, the foreign subsidies regulation is into force. I tried when organizing the panel to have somebody from the European Commission task force speaking, but the, the, the head of the unit told me, no, no, we are too busy. Not only she is busy, but everybody is very busy, which uh, shows that we had better take care. No. <laughs> Something is happening, you know. Uh, to help us uh, understand and put uh, this uh, new regulation into context, we have two speakers. Uh, Alessia Marrazzo, who is a partner with Slayer, an economist. Why? Because, of course, uh, this new regulation is part of of competition law. Competition law is supposed to be based on economics, so we will see whether it's true and uh, whether uh, economists have something to say to, to, to help us to understand or be maybe to implement better the regulation. And we have also the help of S Stefan Sagebro, who is the, head, who is the director for um, uh, industrial policy and competition with the Swedish Business Association. Uh, Stefan, I don't pronounce it in Swedish, sorry. I think no, it's that's fine. It's, that's it's, it's close, safer. Close <laughs> yeah. uh, who unfortunately couldn't, couldn't join us. And it's a, it's a pity, Stefan, because uh, the weather is absolutely nice here in Rome. I hope it's the same in, in Stockholm. Uh, and of course, uh, having the point of view of, bi of European business is very important because European business are supposed to be the beneficiaries of this regulation, but they are also the victims between brackets because the regulation not only apply to non-European businesses, they apply to all the businesses, including, of course, the European one. So after this uh, introduction, I will very quickly uh, let the floor to Alessia, who will explain us uh, why uh, state regulation, state aid, state subsidies should be regulated or why they shouldn't be, and wh what is the economic rationale for having uh, this regulation or maybe for complaining to have it. Thank you, Patrick, and good morning to everyone. And thank you, Patrick, for having invited me to join this panel and uh, represent the economic side of such debated uh, regulation. So let me start by anticipating something about the foreign subsidies regulation, because this regulation deals with subsidies, with foreign subsidies that are selective subsidies. And I think this is very important to uh, stress because the uh, economic case of regulating subsidies is somehow related to their selectivity. Um, so the idea is that if certain economic operators are favored over others by selective subsidies, the playing field becomes uneven. And the idea that uh, lies at the heart of our economy, or at least at the heart of the treaty, is that uh, there sh we should establish a level playing field between economic operators, so there should be no discrimination between, uh, between such operators. And a selective subsidy by favoring some undertaking, undertaking some operators over the other may introduce, may distort competition. Let me make a few examples. These are not random, but they are very much relevant, uh, and you will see that when we will start discussing the regulation. So suppose uh, this selective subsidy 
has been used to enter new markets or increase the market share of, over an operate, of an operator through winning public procurement contract. So thanks to the, sub, the subsidy, the company has won a public procurement contract that otherwise would have not been able to win. So this, is, this means favoring one operator over the others. This means distortion, distortion of competition. Let me make another example, again relevant for the regulation. Suppose that the subsidy, the selective one, is used to finance a loss-making enterprise without a restructuring plan. Why it is important to say without a restructuring plan? Because without, this means that without the subsidy, the operator would have exited the market. So the subsidy in this case is basically providing, of course, an advantage to the recipient and is preventing competitors to increasing, uh, from increasing their market share. So there's also the extreme case when subsidies are granted to companies that, that would not be uh, rewarded by the market forces alone, so it's also determining a misallocation of uh, resources. So I think there is an economic case of regulating uh, selective subsidy, and I think this has been, up to now, somehow reflected in, in the European state rule. So at the time the, um, the state aid policy has been introduced, the, the, there was indeed the concern that the subsidy raises between the uh, member states might, uh, might put at risk the level playing field in the internal market. And now, or at least before the foreign subsidies regulation, there was a concern that uh, the companies receiving foreign subsidies were, get, were, were receiving a benefit and advantage compared to those companies that were not receiving foreign subsidies and were put at the scrutiny of the state aid rules. Uh, and, that, and this again may create uh, some distortion in the economy, may crowd out the non-subsidized companies. So again, I think there is an economic case for regulating selective subsidies. Of course, there might be some risk. And the risks are those that are generally associated to a regulation, because the regulation may have unwanted, unintended, undesirable, not desirable implication consequences. Uh, and these are related to the fact that due to the regulation, uh, investment that may help achieve, ma achieve sustainable growth in a competitive market could be discouraged because of the regulation. And I think this is uh, somehow also the reason why state aid rules have uh, um, gone through a modernization that has been a state aid modernization after the uh, principle stated in the treaty. We have seen the de minimis regulation, the general block exemption regulation, all the state aid guidelines which are related on how to use state aid in a specific sector and, how, and, and, and better clarifies when state aid can be compatible with the internal market. There has also been the communication on the notion of state aid that I will also mention later. Um, in, my, in my intervention. So uh, I think that there has been an effort to, uh, avo to minimize at least the risk f as for state aid re regulation. And maybe I don't want to anticipate uh, what we will discuss later, but, but maybe we have to also minimize the risk related to foreign subsidies regulation. And I'll stop here for the moment. Thank you, Alessia. Uh, I will shortly put my moderator hat off and put the speaker's one on because uh, the European Commission is not here, so I will very briefly uh, summarize the regulation for the people who are not totally aware of, of its contents. So uh, how do I do that? Is there a way to... Ah, great, perfect. So the purpose is clear, level playing field between uh, Europe and the rest of the world. The main, the main question uh, I want to address now is what is a foreign financial subsidy or fi foreign financial contribution, and also to insist on a special feature of this regulation, which is that companies will have to 
uh, get two views about the, the subsidies they receive. First, they, they have to calculate the whole amount of foreign financial contributions, which means without making any difference between the one which are disruptive, the one which are forbidden in one way or problematic, and the one which are unproblematic. So they first have to calculate the whole amount of subsidies they receive because this is with uh, what will trigger uh, the thresholds. You will reach some thresholds by calculating the whole amount of subsidies you receive. And then, of course, to conduct the substantial analysis, you need to know which of these subsidies are disruptive. This is the main question. Globally, the definition of uh, foreign financial contribution is not very different from this, the one you know in understated regulation, you know, uh, public money, uh, etc. Uh, and they are disruptive essentially when they are uh, when they discriminate, to, to to put it very shortly. Nevertheless, it will work work better. Okay, indeed. I want to focus on two points. Uh, the first one is that all sales to public bodies are supposed to be financial contributions, not necessarily disruptive, of course. It means that if you are a company manufacturing buses and you sell buses to a Brazilian city, this is a financial contribution from the state because it's a, the, your client is a city. And it's the same if you sell everything, services or goods, to any public entity in the world, state, city, uh, state-owned company, you know, you, you have a wind, for wind farm somewhere and you sell electricity to a, to a state-owned uh, utility, this is a public subsidy, which looks a little strange. And when is it sub disruptive? Well, of course, it's when I in I it improves, as Alessia has explained, the competitive status of uh, the recipient. That's conceptually quite easy to understand. Now, uh, the regulation contains three tools. Two tools are based on notifications, and the third one is based on an uh, investigation by the European Commission, uh, deciding by itself or because somebody complains to investigate. Notification requirements are happens in two situations, mergers or uh, when a company wants to respond to a public tender in Europe. Public tender sent, uh, decided by any public client, you know, city, state, etc. So for m and transactions, uh, there is a, a notification requirement if a threshold is met, it's, it's, it's cumulative, uh, the target should have sales of more than 500 million euro in Europe, so it's not all mergers, fortunately, big mergers. Uh, and a second cumulative threshold is that the purchaser has uh, received, and the, the undertakings concerned, sorry, has received state aid from uh, foreign non-EU states, of more than 50 million euro during the last three years. And if it's a little complicated because in your notification form you will take into account different uh, subsidies in different ways. And then you notify and you have a procedure very similar to the merger control procedure with phase one, possible phase two. And this is an independent procedure. You know, it's not in the same uh, procedure that you will notify your merger to the, the European Commission. So you could have to file twice, uh, twice to the DigiConf, to the same uh, European body, but you file twice, and you are facing two different and separate procedures. Then you have a second tool, which is a filing obligation, when you have to respond to a public procurement tender. Again, you have, you have thresholds. The contract value should be more than 250 million euros, so it's not for day-to-day -day small contracts, but you know, 
250 million euro because if, if the contract is about, for instance, a concession, you know, you, you will, uh, that lasts 20 years, you know, for, you know, I, I don't know, uh, uh, heating network in the city, you know, very long lasting uh, concessions. This threshold can be reached uh, quite easily. And then you have a cumulative threshold, which is this time very low about the financial contribution because it's 4 million euro instead of 50 million. So it can be reached, of course, very easily as well. And you have, again, to notify to the commission. Well, you have different rules, the minimis thresholds, and then you have a third tool, which is investigation. So the European Commission can investigate and take a number of decisions. Uh, they, they can, um, you know, retro-investigate during a long time, and they can ask a lot of information. Of course, there is a big question mark. How will the Commission be able to retrieve information about subsidies received in Brazil, in China, in India? It's a complicated question. When we ask the Commission, they tell us they will rely a lot about plaintiffs, people who who are in the know or was it, what is happening. And of course, the, the Commission will be able to punish companies if they don't respond correctly to uh, RFIs. And what can the Commission do? Uh, it can, uh, of course, issue a non-objection uh, non decision, good news. Uh, they can uh, request commitments, uh, regressive measures, uh, even fines. And uh, the regressive measures are quite interesting because they could unwind uh, previous mergers. Uh, they could uh, impose, for instance, uh, to license uh, intellectual property rights that have been acquired thanks to foreign subsidies. So there is a number of things which are quite new uh, in the, in the lands landscape and uh, that, that could happen to companies who have received too much, too many uh, disruptive uh, subsidies. And this time there, there are no thresholds, uh, so a lot of things can, can happen. It's a very, the third tool is very open, of course. So this is what uh, the Commission has now in its hands. And I will revert to, to Stefan uh, with a very simple question. So uh, are European business happy or unhappy <laughs> with uh, the outcome of this, uh, of this long-awaited uh, uh, level playing field uh, instrument? Thank you, Patrick. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, it's, it works. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you for, for having me and thank you for the question. I will try to, to respond. Uh, and. Um, well, um, I can I can say uh, as an overarching comment, it's been an, uh, an up and down journey. I think it's been a long journey since we had the the white paper uh, that is sort of started this process, and then um, we uh, we got the regulation and uh, eventually also the the uh, implementing regulation just this summer, and then we started to understand a bit more. I think what this uh, what this tool really means for for companies and also EU companies. But uh, to start off, I think our first reaction was very positive when this was presented. Um, it's an important new regulation. As uh, Alessio and, and yourself uh, have talked about, it is about safeguarding level play fields on the internal market. So I think it's very reasonable that more or less at least the same rules apply to subsidies regardless of their origin, if it's from EU member states or, or from third countries. So there has been a regu regulatory gap, I think, just as the Commission have uh, have um, have described it. So uh, and still, I think this is a fundamentally it's a good tool to have. But uh, as you have alluded to, and and as I think we eventually understood when we read the white paper, but also the impact assessment, we we understood that this will also lead to high administrative burden on EU companies, uh, not only companies based in third countries, but, but all companies. Uh, and it's because of the chosen model that we have these mandatory notifications uh, that leads to uh, a lot of burden, but also this, this uh, model where we have, uh, uh, that are based on these 
uh, financial contributions as you have described them and not targeting only, um, only foreign subsidies. And if you compare it to the stated rules, uh, I mean, there companies does not have to notify all economic transactions that they do with public entities. Of course, that would be, that would be, uh, be very strange, I think, compared to the system that we have right now. Instead, it's up to the member states to self-assess when something is state aid, when something is uh, fulfilling the, the uh, Article 107.1 in, uh, in the treaty. And also business must, must do this. They cannot rely on legitimate expectations. They also have to understand if something is state aid and what kind of uh, impact that would have if uh, the member states have not made sure that this is, uh, this is in line with EU state aid rules. So companies already have to do this kind of assessment when it comes to state aid, but apparently in this case, uh, the commission thought that this is not enough. They need more more information perhaps, or they cannot put this burden on companies that they have to assess whether something is uh, a selective benefit and, and thus constitute a subsidy rather than just a contribution. So, um, as you described, companies now have to take stock of all economic interaction more or less that we ha they have with public entities in, in third states. Uh, this is called financial contribution. I think the term is, is a bit difficult because it you don't really perceive that you are being granted some sort of contribution when you're, for instance, selling buses to, to a, a city in Brazil, for instance, but uh, nevertheless, this is the case. So, uh, and this data are then supposed to be submitted to the commission. So this is, of course, very burdensome, especially for large countries, for large groups, maybe global groups active in, in uh, many parts of the world. Uh, and I think this, uh, these, uh, aspects of the regulation uh, was not maybe uh, in focus initially from, from colleagues of mine in the business community, but I think the community gradually woke up to this reality uh, that there is a need of, of more balance and, um, and a more targeted tool. Um, and I think the commission eventually have listened as well, only a bit too late perhaps. Uh, I think uh, some uh, adjustments were made to the, uh, to the uh, to the very regulation, the foreign subsidy regulation, but um, I think they woke up maybe a bit too late to put things uh, put things there. Instead, I think it was during the drafting of the implementing regulation that came this summer that they sort of realized that they really need to ease the burden and adjust some things in, in the regulation. So I think they have done uh, in that sense, a good work uh, tr trying to do this. They have, uh, when it comes to the uh, to the reporting, they have excluded transactions made on market terms uh, and also general tax measures. So these are the kind of transactions that you don't have to list uh, when you do this notification. Um, so that that is, of course, a very good thing and other things uh, generally can be grouped together based on what type of transaction they constitute and also you can group it uh, per third country as well. Uh, so this is of course are making the notification uh, and the reporting a bit easier. However, you still have to sort of keep track on all these transactions to, to, to be able to get them in the first place and then group them. So you can only get so far at least um, regarding this implementing regulation. So um, to sort of sum up this part at least, I think it's, it's a complex set of rules of course and for many companies this will be a big task to conduct, to gather all this information in particular. And I think we're also a bit uh, concerned now initially when we hear reports about uh, quite low staffing at DGCOMP uh, not that many uh, have been hired and, and set to this team. And maybe uh, a testament to this, to this is the fact that we don't have anyone from the commission today with us. Uh, they are very busy, as you say. So um, this, and they also have been signaling, signaling I think, uh, in, in the media and in, in interviews that they will initially at least focus on these notifications uh, that will surely come in uh, and also pre-notification contacts from, from companies that wonder how they are to be able to, 
to comply with the rules. This means that they won't probably be able to do much, much ex officio work initially at least. Uh, and that is the part of the rules which we think is the most important one because either based on their own intelligence or based on complaints, I think this is uh, where they will sort of catch the big fish. So uh, we hope that they will staff up and, and be able to focus on, on that part of the regulation. Thanks. Thank you, Stefan. So basically a very good theoretical idea and some uh, implementation problems, which is quite usual with uh, European law. Uh, and so in any event, uh, it's now in force, we have to face it. Uh, and Stefan uh, rightly insisted on the, the difference with state aid. One of the difference with state aid, uh, traditionally e within EU state aid regulation, is that uh, in state aid, it's up to the st member states to notify uh, the, the, their aid regimes or their, their aid decisions to the Commission. So there's, there's a kind of protection. It's not a full protection because, as everybody knows, if the states are act wrongly, it, it will be up to the recipient company to, 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 to give the money back. So uh, companies must take care. But nevertheless, they are helped by, by the states. While here, uh, companies are alone in one way to, to make their judgments, uh, to, to gather the information, etc. So, and we don't have for the moment, uh, uh, you know, block exemptions. Um, we don't really have uh, guidelines. Th th there is a Q&A, which is not that bad, but it's not really guidelines because uh, the Commission will, ha will wait until they have more, uh, more uh, track record, you know, to issue, to issue guidelines. Uh, so it's, it's the beginning of um, a difficult period for, for companies, but fortunately uh, there are economists who are here to help. So Alessia, <laughs> what can you do to alleviate this burden or help the companies to bet better understand the, 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 the impact of the regulation? Thank you, Patrick. I'm sorry because I'm, I think I'm about to introduce even more uncertainty about this regulation, but uh, I'll try to do, to do my best. So mm, uh, I think that uh, economic analysis has uh, a big role uh, in this uh, regulation, even bigger than the one we had with state aid. And uh, I actually want to make a parallel with state aid because I think that there is some overlapping within the two regulation, but up to, to, to a given point. Then, and, and, and I will explain. I will explain why. So let me start with the uh, with the, the state aid rules. So we know that the treaty says that basically an aid granted by member states or through uh, state resources which distorts or threatens to distort competition by favoring certain undertakings over the other, insofar it affects uh, trade between member states, is incompatible with internal market. So. This is what the treaty says and which are the constituent elements of the notion of state aid. I think the most important one, at least from economic perspective, uh, is the advantage. It's the fact that the aid will provide, is incompatible with the market when it provides an advantage, an economic benefit to, to an undertaking. And how economists have quantified, have assessed whether there, there is an economic uh, benefit coming from the aid. We basically see whether there is a benefit that the undertaking could have not ob uh, obtained under normal market conditions. And how do we estimate the normal market condition? How do we, do we identify which are the normal market condition? The union courts have developed this market economic, uh, eco market economy investor principle that we economists have used a lot. And the idea of this principle is basically that we need to assess whether in similar circumstances, a private investor, investor would have done the same investment that the, the state has done or mm, uh, the same investment done uh, with, with, with indeed the state resources. So let's think about uh, a capital injection and uh, I really like this kind of example because it, I think it makes the assessment a little bit more complicated because you have to think about capital injection as an infusion of cash. So basically it, it, it can go everywhere within the firm. So it is not related to a specific activity or investment. And you have to assess whether this 
capital in, in injection uh, done with state resources is, is an aid incompatible with internal market or not. So you apply the uh, market economy investor principle and you basically assess whether uh, any private investor would have been prompt to make the same investment. And uh, I think that assessing the economic benefit, assessing whether the aid provides an economic benefit, basically summarize every uh, all the elements that uh, constitute that 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 are that are that are, that are, that are at the heart of the notion of state aid, because. Uh, in the moment in which you have uh, uh, a benefit, uh, basically there is also a distortion of competition because the aid is, li is liable to improve the competitive position of the recipient compared to its competitors. And indeed, uh, mm, if you think about which is the role of assessing of the distortion of competition in state aid, uh, it's very limited because once you have done, once you have checked the selectivity, the advantage, whether indeed there is a benefit, you basically have also absorbed the assessment of the distortion of competition. And this is, I think, in line with what the, com the, the, the commission notice of the notion of state aid say, because the, 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 the notice says that a distortion of competition within uh, the meaning of, of the treaty is generally found to exist when the state grants a f a, an advantage to an undertaking in a market where there is or could be competition. So if in the market there is or could be competition and you have the benefit, the selectivity and so on, then there is distortion of competition. Why I'm stressing this? Because I think this is different from what we have in the foreign subsidies regulation. So let's look at Article 3 of foreign subsidies regulation that basically defines some foreign subsidies. Again, you have a foreign subsidies uh, when there is uh, um, a financial contribution from a third countries which confers a benefit to a given undertaking or a given sector, so a given group of undertakings. So again, the, the two conditions, the, the condition that you have similar to state aid are the fact that there has, there has to be a benefit and there has to be a selectivity. And of course also there has to be a, a financial contribution from, third, from a third country because we're talking about the foreign, foreign subsidies of, of course. But then the regulation states that, uh, uh, states that unlike state aid, that uh, uh, unlike state aid, foreign subsidies are not generally prohibited because what uh, basically the companies have to do or basically the commission will do is to assess on a case by case whether the, the, the foreign subsidy distorts the internal market. So the distortion of competition play, I think a big, plays a bigger role here and indeed the regulation provides a list of non-exhaustive indicators on how to assess whether there has been a distortion of competition. An example of such, non -ex no such indicators is the amount of the foreign, um, the, the foreign subsidies. And I think is the, 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 the idea is that if the uh, size of the, uh, the, the subsidy is very large in absolute terms or is very large compared to the size of the market or to the value of the investment, then it is more likely that that subsidy is said as a relevant or at least a not negligible effect in the market. So I think it makes sense to have this list of indicators to understand which uh, kind of subsidies uh, uh, need a, a, cl a closer scrutiny and an assessment. But actually the regulation uh, mm, with Article 5 further clarifies which are the uh, conditions, the circumstances that are most likely to distort, uh, to distort competition. And I want to focus uh, on one that uh, I think, at, at least from my point of view, is the most interesting one. Also, also when you try to understand which kind of economic analysis you have to do. And the condition on which I want to focus that again, according to Article 5, is the one that is most likely to distort competition, is that the foreign subsidy directly facilitate a concentration. So when the foreign subsidies facilitate a concentration, it is more likely that it distorts competition. But uh, what does it mean? Which is then the kind of economic assessment that we have to do? So think about, let's, let's make an example, again, the capital injection example. So let's assume that there is a capital injection from, uh, a, third, uh, from a third country. 
um, and uh, we want to understand whether this, uh, um, this capital in injection that represent a financial contribution from a third country represent a foreign subsidy. So the first thing that we have to do is to understand whether it is selective and whether it confers a benefit. And as we said before, as we did with state aid, as economists generally do with state aid, we have to understand whether the private investor would have done the same investment. Because in this way, we understand whether there is a benefit or not. So assume there is a benefit. Do we have to stop here? I think no, because the idea of the regulation, uh, again, is to assess whether that foreign subsidy distorts competition. And one of the conditions is that it facilitates, whether it facilitates a concentration. So the question now is, how do we prove it? It is uh, enough that the foreign subsidy is benefiting, is benefiting a certain prospective buyer over alternative buyer to have it facilitating a concentration, or we need to prove that the subsidy has triggered the acquisition. So basically that without the foreign subsidies, the acquisition would have not occurred. Because if this is the case that the economic analysis have to do uh, a step further compared to what we do with state analysis. Because again, we have to assess the kind of, the, the, the kind of investment that has been done, and we have to understand whether the net present value of the acquisition, so again, we look at the, at the, uh, at the, at the cost of the investment and the return, and now we take, in, we, we take also into account the acquisition. So the cost of the acquisition, the return that the company may receive, from the acquisition. And again, considering all these elements, we have to understand whether a private investor would have done the same. Because this will help us understanding whether in the counterfactual, without the foreign subsidies, the company would have been able to do the, uh, the, the concentration. Because this is the, I, I mean, this at least is, is, is my interpretation of the, uh, uh, of the condition facilita that, that says facilitating a concentration. But it would be good to, to understand better indeed which is the uh, uh, economic analysis, uh, the, the, kind of the, the kind of assessment to which we have to converge. And let me also um, make uh, uh, a few, a few, a few additions. The first one is that um, I think this assessment is, 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 it can, can be complicated uh, because uh, as Patrick also was mentioning before, uh, the, uh, when company uh, are notifying a concentration uh, that involves a financial contribution granted by non-new uh, governments, the uh, a form template for concentration that, that has been attached to the implementing regulation asks for each foreign financial contribution granted to the notifying parties in the three years before the notification. So see, if we go back to the condition that the foreign subsidies has to facilitate the concentration to distort competition, that means that we have to understand whether financial contribution received in the three years before the concentration, the notification, facilitate the concentration. So it is very difficult to understand how to make the link. Between, uh, between the two. Of course, the counterfactual analysis that I was uh, mm, explaining before can help, but it's very difficult. And uh, the other thing that I want to stress uh, that has already been said before is that basically the company have to, do make, uh, have to make this assessment. Because if you look again at the template uh, form for the concentration that has been attached to the implementing regulation, it's the company that has to say whether that foreign subsidies facilitate, con uh, facilitate a concentration. So it's a very, um, I think it is a very complicated assessment. Uh, it is not clear which is the perimeter of this assessment from an economic point of view. So it would be good to have, uh, to have uh, some clarification on, on this, and I'm curious to see what will, will happen. Thank you, Alessia. So we are both uh, frightened <laughs> because it's complicated, <laughs> but reassured by the fact that <laughs> economists will be here to, to, to help companies. But, of course, all what you say concerns the second part of the notification form, mm -hmm. the, the, the part where uh, in-depth analysis is yeah. conducted. Mm -hmm. There is still the first part, which uh, uh, where, you know, only the, 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 the amount of subsidies without giving any thought about whether they, they, they distort competition or not should, should be gathered. So 
economists will not help companies in all the difficult aspects of uh, this uh, question. And so I will revert again to, to, to Stefan to ask him whether he and his organization uh, have some uh, advice, some recommendation, some yep. uh, probably high level recommendation at this stage for, for companies, how to prepare, how to be ready, etc. Sure. No, uh, of course, uh, I just wanted to to say thanks to Alessia for, for doing a deep dive into these aspects uh, regarding Article 5. I think these are maybe the most uh, puzzling parts and, and difficult parts maybe for, for companies to deal with. Um, so this you described Article 5.1.D regarding the concentrations. I'm, I think the situation is the same regarding the E letter uh, regarding... Uh, a foreign subsidy enabling an undertaking to submit an unduly advantageous tender on the basis of which the undertaking could be awarded the relevant contract. I think the situation is also there. It's quite difficult for companies to, to do this kind of assessment. First of all, as you said, whether uh, certain financial contributions constitute a foreign subsidy and then the linkage between that foreign subsidy and uh, either the concentration or the, the tender, uh, what what is necessary to uh, consider that there is a linkage, sort of. So there, I think we really need more uh, more clarifications from the Commission, um, because it's a big deal if something falls under Article 5, really, because then you have to do this much more qualitative uh, description of the of the foreign um, foreign subsidy, if that is the case. So um, yeah, how? Do business prepare and how should they prepare for this? I mean, I hope those who are in scope already are preparing, <laughs> but um, I guess that is not the case always. I think it differs a lot between different companies. Some companies, I, I perceive, have um, still to realize sort of that they are covered uh, and uh, that there is still, uh, in some cases, the perception that this is only directed towards companies based in third countries. Um, uh, and, and some don't really uh, understand the scope maybe that they should be preparing right now and not wait until the situation occurs where they are sort of covered by the rules um, on, on, on concentrations and procurement. But there are also some companies that have been very engaged uh, throughout this entire process um, and, and that they have really done their homework, they have analyzed what the rules mean to them and they have also started collecting data setting up systems to gather uh, data from maybe an entire group uh, if that is the case and also some companies have started to take pre-notification contacts with the commission so uh, just to understand what does this mean to them it could be in relation to an upcoming procurement for instance or something that it, uh, is not that concrete, but uh, uh, more on a theoretical basis. So my, my tips, uh, my best tips, I think, um, some of them may be very basic, uh, perhaps, but first of all, I think companies, first of all, need to uh, assess, will we be uh, covered by the thresholds regarding um, concentrations and public procurement, if they are at all active in public procurement area, sort of. Just do a general assessment. Is it conceivable that we in the near future will perform a, uh, a concentration involving companies of, of, uh, of this size and uh, or engaging in tenders of this size? So these kind of thresholds, just look at those and see if it is conceivable that you will be covered. And then as a second step, you have to do some sort of general assessment. Well, what about these thresholds? in relation to financial contributions uh, from third countries, the 50 million in concentrations and 4 million in public procurement. Do we at all have any, any activity in third countries and, and to what extent are we in contact with, uh, with uh, state-owned entities, sort of? Uh, and remember, this also includes not only selling and, and buying goods and services, but also taxes and fees. Um, so if you pay your your electricity bill, for instance, uh, this will be covered uh, as a baseline. So uh, that is, I think, is the first uh, first thing to do. And then uh, maybe to 
uh, consider doing some sort of pre-notification contacts with the commission. I think the commission has been clear that they welcome these kind of uh, contacts. Um, and uh, maybe before then, look at the commission web page, as you said, Patrick, uh, the Q&A page. They, it contains uh, quite some interesting questions and answers, and uh, it is to be updated regularly, so keep an eye on that one uh, to get some, some good facts. But then, of course, you have to do an, anal an, analy an analysis of uh, uh, how um, your own company are, are covered by these rules if you are assessing that you will uh, be hit by these thresholds. What kind of transactions do you do in your company or in your group? Uh, which one of those are covered? And uh, set, up, set up some sort of a system to gather this data. And also to start in time, I think, uh, gathering this data and setting up these systems will take some time. So it can't be done at least right before you are intending to do a concentration or, or um, leaving a bid in a public procurement. You have to do this um, quite a bit uh, time ahead. So um, that is my, my tips and, and some just two things also to look out for, I think, uh, so you don't misunderstand this. First of all, in the reporting, um, in the... Uh, implementing regulation, they have sort of included additional thresholds uh, of different kinds um, to limit the number of transactions that need to be described. So you have uh, additional thresholds if you are below those for individual transactions, for instance, often it's one, one million euro. If, you, if you're below that, then you ha don't have to include this in your reporting, for instance. The thing is that this does not mean that those kind of transactions can be excluded when you are sum, summing up how much foreign financial contributions you are receiving in total from uh, third countries. So you have to sort of still, even though these are included to make it easier to report, you still have to sort of gather all this information to make an assessment of whether you are covered by the, the reporting obligation at all. So just don't uh, misunderstand that. Uh, so it could even be that you are forced to report something, but it's only a lot of small transactions, and then you, it could be that you have to send in a form that is blank, even. So it's uh, a bit silly, but th that can at least in theory be, be uh, a result of this. And also finally, um, when it comes to tenders, and what kind of um, parts of a group are covered. I think this has been clarified to the, by the Commission on different occasions that uh, in relation to Article 28 in the, in the original regulation, uh, if you read that, um, it is, is said that, um, that the economic operator itself uh, are covered uh, when you sort of gather these financial contributions, and also the direct and indirect parent companies, as well as subsidiary companies without commercial autonomy, but, and this is important, not sister companies. So when it comes to public procurement, if you are active on the internal market and you have a sister company in a third, uh, in a third country who deals with the business in that third country, then you won't have to do any notification uh, based on those transactions in the third country if it, if it is dealt with by a sister company sort of with, with uh, commercial autonomy. So that is something to to keep in mind, and that is something that could at least ease the burden a bit when it comes to public procurement. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. So basically, uh, now we have to face it. It was a good idea. The implementation by uh, the European Union is uh, complicated, but it's now in force, uh, and companies must, uh, companies and their advisors must, must adapt. Maybe uh, we should add that this is not only a burden, it can also be an opportunity, of course. I, I, if you are competing against another purchaser to, to buy a target, and if you suspect that this purchaser is uh, ben benefiting from uh, foreign subsidies, of course you can complain, you can uh, use it. And uh, even more broadly regarding the third tool, uh, if you, uh, on, on the long term, you see a competitor, uh, you know, uh, 
winning market shares and you suspect that the reason is that because this competitor is really distorted competition thanks to, to, to the help he, they, they receive from uh, foreign states, of course, why not uh, lodge a complaint with the European Commission? So no, no, uh, let us not see it totally negatively. Uh, it's also an opportunity. It could also be an opportunity. But globally, it's uh, certainly complicated, both from an administrative point of view and also from a substantial point, point of view, uh, that, uh, that the message we, we wanted to, to convey to you. And uh, now, I, if we have time, I don't know. We don't have time for Q&A. No. Q, but not A. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one yeah. question. I don't know. One question, a short one. Either, either people are very compliant with the timing, <laughs> or we said absolutely everything, so there is no room for question. Okay, so uh, le, le, let uh, you join me thanking our two uh, panelists, and uh, thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan. <laughs>